right, so this video we're looking at the inference procedure to compare two population means using hypothesis testing, right? Hypothesis testing. So what we want to talk about here is what's the difference between this new method of hypothesis testing and the procedures that we learned before when we're only looking at one population. Here we're comparing two population means. In the past we're looking at just one population mean. What's different about the procedure? Well, let's talk about mainly what's similar so that we realize that we don't have to change too much to be able to accomplish this hypothesis testing procedure. The first thing is that we still have a claim and we still have to write that down in our very first step of the problem. We want to identify the claim immediately, get it written down in symbolic form. So we might have a claim something like, you know, the mean for the first population is greater than or equal to the mean for the second population, right? That could be a claim we're dealing with. So it's just one I've made up here. Um, sometimes you'll see the books express this by moving the population here on the right, moving that symbol over to the left-hand side. And when you do that, what you end up getting is since it's positive on this side, when you bring it over, it becomes negative, right? Just a little algebra there. And then you keep the orientation of this exactly the same. And since you remove that quantity, the only thing left there is zero. And this number is actually referred to as D naught. The reason why I'm saying is D naught is because if you see that this has an equal sign, this would be the null hypothesis as well as the claim. And so D naught means that the subscript indicating that that's from the null hypothesis. And that's the difference that they're dealing with. The difference between these things is zero here. They're dealing with that difference. All right, of course, it could be 10, it could be 5. But if you want to make a statement like that, then you'd have to actually you know, express it like the difference between population 1 and 2 is greater than or equal to 10 or 15 or whatever. But either way, that number is called d sub 0. And you'll see it again used in the test stat formula. But for now, you know, expressing a claim like this is perfectly acceptable or like this. Either way is fine. I'm just going to use this one up here to save some room, so I'm going to erase the second choice. All right, now, from there, once we have that, after getting the claim in the past, we always found HOHA. That's the same now. We don't change that. So HOHA, putting them in that order, HOHA, we do that in the same way we did before. So, of course, we look at the symbol that's in the claim, and we say, is the claim HO or HA? Because it says greater than or equal to, I'll let that be my HO because it has an equal sign as part of it, right? And then, of course, the HA becomes the opposite or the complement of that. So it'll be less than here because if you're not greater than or equal to something, you must be less than it, right? Okay, so that's the competing pair of hypotheses, HO, HA. So that's pretty much the same as what we did before, except for we have two population mean symbols in the statements. All right, step three was always for us getting the data. Well, we still do the same thing here. And the only difference is that for the data step now, we actually have two little groups of data. So we have kind of um, group one or population one, right? And we have group two. So this is kind of the big difference here between um, the procedure that we're using now and the one we used in the past. But we have two sets of data. So we'll have you know, an N for this group, we will have um, an X bar for this group. We will have a standard deviation for this group, okay? So M1, X bar 1, S1, and we'll have the same thing for group 2. It'll be N2, X bar 2, S2. So we have those three quantities for group 2 as well. And then, of course, we often have a significance level alpha, so that'll be given in the problem as well. So those are usually the items we get. So usually about seven items come in the data step. You can find those in the problem. All right, and then from step four, we used to do our test stat procedure, and we still do the same thing here. Step four is still the test stat. When calculating the test stat, you need a formula. So in our case, we'll assume it's Z for this problem. Of course, in order for it to be Z, you have to meet some conditions. And um, in my class, I just require that the sample sizes here are both over 30. If that's the case, I let my students use Z. Um, for some classes, you'll need to have, say, the sample sizes be over 30 and you'll have to know the population standard deviations. Not in my class, though. I just look for large sample sizes, and then you can use C. And then the formula actually becomes this. It's going to be x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So that's the first part of it. And then you're going to subtract off that difference, d sub 0, that we would have had from the claim, right? And in most cases, in the elementary classes, it's just 0. The number there is just 0. So if you don't see a number in the claim anywhere, you just put zero there. So a lot of times, you don't even have to worry about that little part of the formula. And then you have the denominator of the formula, which is the standard error for this quantity. 
and that's actually sigma over n plus sigma over n, sigma squared, sigma squared, one, two, one, two. Okay, so what this is is actually the population variance for the first population divided by the sample size we used, the population variance for the second population divided by the sample size we used, and if you don't have these quantities, you can use S as a substitute here. If you're in my class, when the sample size is large, you can use the S as a substitute for that. In um, other classes, of course, you would actually need to know these quantities to use Z because the professors are often more formal and require you to actually know the population standard deviation to use Z. So you just have to go by what's okay in your classroom. In my classroom, as long as these n's are larger than 30, we can go ahead and use S's as a substitute for those population sigmas. All right. Okay, but either way, that's your test stat formula. From there, we used to use um, a critical value or a p-value, and we can do that here as well. We're going to use, let's say, in this procedure, the critical value. So our critical value, which is step five, that quantity is going to be found much in the same way it was found before. So if that was basically finding a z alpha value. Sometimes it would be z alpha divided by two, depending on h a, right? When I look at this h a, I can see that it's indicating a left tail test based on what I have here as my symbol, a less than symbol. So I know I'll be putting my alpha all into one tail on the left hand side. So in step five, the z alpha value, which is our critical value, is what we need to find. And it turns out that there isn't any change for that here. Nothing really changes in step five. So if you know how to do that in the past, you still know how to do it now. When you look at our practice problems that show how to work out problems like this, you'll see how that's done. That's very easy. And then lastly, we have the same two steps we had before, initial conclusion and final conclusion. That's steps six and seven. So in step six, you form the initial conclusion. And remember, our initial conclusion was whether we rejected the null or whether we didn't reject the null, right? So either we rejected it or we didn't. But that's basically your initial conclusion. It's the same here as well. You're going to compare this test that to your critical value. If your test stat lands in the rejection region, you go ahead and reject HO. If it doesn't, you say you don't reject it. And then finally, step seven is the final conclusion. And that doesn't change as well. That's the same as it was before. So you just really use the same procedure. You would identify the claim and ask whether it's HO or HA. In this case, it's HO. And you would word your conclusion, your conclusion according to that. So if we decided to reject HO, we would say, based on this claim being HO, we rejected HO, we say the sample data allows us to reject the claim. If we're unable to reject the claim in step six, I mean reject HO, then since the claim is HO, we'd say the sample data does not allow us to reject the claim, so on and so forth. So seven step procedure, step six is the same, step seven is the same, step five is the same, none of those change. Steps one and two are virtually the same. The data step, pretty much the same, a little more material to gather. Test that formula is a little different, but the same basic idea. So I would say that even though it's a new technique of hypothesis testing, it's very similar to the old one. And when you look at the practice problems and you practice along with those, you should be able to master this technique just like you can master the other one before.